it's all the way. I feel bad for him. <laughs> yeah, his sleeping schedule is messed up right now. Very much so. He's having he lunch at 4 a.m. Hmm? Anthony's sleeping schedule is going to be messed up forever. Yes, yes it is. I, know, I think he can adjust back, but it's going to take a little bit of time for him to adjust back. So yeah, we're going to just wait a few minutes for people to show up. For sure. So I was uh, Cal, Pop Cal Poly Pomona handling all the COVID stuff. Are you guys returning <laughs> back to school? I think we're doing hybrid in fall. Yeah, we yeah. still... Like your choice, I guess. Yeah, we're still in home right now. <sighs> I want to get it's out a, of here. This is a drive through <laughs> uh, graduation. Oh, yeah. Actually, a lot of the uh, people we're interviewing, it's kind of hard because we understand that a lot of them um, are basically school from home. Um, so they lack a lot of the hands-on skills that you would develop in a lab, for example, like using oscilloscopes, logic, you know, any of those tools and, you know, they're kind of rusty. So it, mm -hmm. from like the interviewing side, it's kind of difficult too, because we, we want somebody that understands all that, but, you know, understanding the situation that all you guys are kind of stuck at home, you know, <laughs> kind of sucks. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. There was there was one time where I was talking to one of my classmates and he had a class where they had to they had to use oscilloscopes and what they had to do because you know no one can afford one is that they had to create a file and then send the file to the professor for them to check it. Was it a CSV or I think it was like like intro to uh, like circuit design circuit analysis. Like no, that. no, I, I meant the file. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's because they just they just couldn't have uh, an oscilloscope right now, which sucks. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would definitely recommend investing, you know, especially if you want to be in, in an embedded software engineer, I would definitely recommend investing in something like an oscilloscope, logic analyzer, um, you know, soldering tools if you had it, um, a, a decent multimeter. You don't need something fancy, but, you know, a basic multimeter would work. Um, but these tools actually would widely used in this, you know, type of field and industry. Um, you know, it's, it's a really big plus when we do know someone that knows how to do all that stuff and why to use it. So it's, it's definitely a big plus if you can talk about it on your resume. <clears throat> yeah, just like, I think the purpose of the lab is just to learn how to use the tools and, you know, understand why you're using it. <clears throat> and just kind of like a big bummer if you're not able to, you know, physically be there and, and play with it you know you just just learn way more when you see the person yeah uh, i mean i'll probably be talking about um maybe the few things that you know you can use oscilloscopes for especially for robotics i think there's a lot of applicable um uses for oscilloscopes or you know logic analyzers so that's probably on my list of to do's i think i mean this is kind of related Flash unrelated. I know uh, Keysight. <laughs> they have like their Keysight University online, where they basically go through like at least with their equipment mm -hmm. how to use it and like where to apply it. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a bunch of giveaways too. So I've signed up for like everything, just <laughs> hoping I can save money and they yes. I just win somehow. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, we do take that into consideration when we do hire people. So it, it's kind of rough on the employers too because we don't depending on the stage of the company, if they're trying to push out the production part of it, it's kind of hard to hire someone that we need to train in order to do a lot of that stuff. So it, it really depends on the timing and, you know, what the state of the company is, but, you know, I'll, I'll probably be talking about that as well. Um, but it's 12 o'clock. I don't know if you guys want to begin. Is this like everyone that? Yeah, but I think we should just give it five more minutes because sure. barely anyone is here right now. So are you guys uh, interested in the aerospace industry at all or? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit need to first, you know, mm -hmm. get some experience with it. 
Yes, I am. But um, there's a lot of like, restrictions and stuff, stuff for international students. It's kind of sad. But, yeah, yeah, um, that's that's the only bad thing um, too, because a lot of the stuff is um, you know you work with the government, so it being international is hard. Um, but I'll try to think of a recommendation, maybe um, sometime the end of this interview, because I know there's some companies out there that will sponsor you, <clears throat> but they do, they're, they're more on the manufacturing side than the actual R&D side. So if you avoid companies that are R&D, then you might be able to get like a sponsorship, like the H1B visa, I think. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, thank you. So are any of you guys interested in being uh, embedded software engineer or engineer, or are you guys mainly just focusing in software engineering in general? Um, I'm, I'm like personally mechanical, mm -hmm. but I, I like right now after COVID, like I've been coding a lot. Basically everything, every project I just turned out to be coding because you can't actually do, you know, mess with. I, I mess with actual instruments and you know. Mm -hmm. Are are you mechatronics? No, 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 no I'm not mechatronics. I'm mechanical. Oh, you're mechanical. Oh, okay, yeah. Actually, um, <laughs> I was gonna offer to um <laughs> get some insight from my coworkers because they have, uh, you know, a lot of experience. Some some of them worked at Tesla. Some of them worked at you know Umbra, like a lot of space systems. So, I was I was thinking about including some mechanical stuff, but I wasn't sure if this talk you know would have would have anyone um mechanical basically um yeah. but i could probably send maybe an email out to harper and then maybe some information for mechanical engineers maybe the type of like interview questions that you should expect and then you know, pass that along yeah that would be definitely helpful because uh generally for a body club like most of the people the people from like different engineering degrees just come basically for robotics and think, uh, even computer science majors mm -hmm. computer engineering so yeah. like we really have this diverse group of engineering uh, members <laughs> that we have right now. Yeah, I, and I, I guess, let me tell you this, um, everyone, all the mechanical engineers at our company are pretty proficient with um, Python uh, just because it's such a useful uh, analysis tool. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, it's, know. you know, it's free versus MATLAB where I think a floating license costs around 6,000. You know, so it, it, it's not really worth it if we can just do the exact same thing in Python. So a lot yeah, of- Yeah, I agree because I've been using Python myself recently. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'd be like, I, I just first learned it here in your body's club, honestly. So mm -hmm. that has been helping me a lot. But the, the negatives is that uh, basically, is that it doesn't, like sometimes you kind of like find exactly the libraries that you can work with basically. You mm -hmm. know, like if you're doing control systems, MATLAB would be much more helpful with the diagrams and stuff, you know? Yeah, I, I, I've done um, control system analysis, like the transient and um, steady state behavior of the pump for a propulsion system. Um, it's really interesting. Um, you know, there's, like I said, there's a lot of application uses for Python just because you have Jupyter Lab. And uh, uh, most of our engineers use uh, a combination of Jupyter Lab and um, LaTeX uh, as a way to kind of create data reports. So it's really useful, especially for mechanical. Data. Oh yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, it's, it's like really helpful that you can, you can like write equations up there in mm -hmm. Jupyter lab and Jupyter notebooks. Well, um, I guess we can start now. Okay, sure. Um, let me share the screen, I guess. Uh, bu -bu -bu. Let me find the, give me a moment. So, the, I didn't put a lot of work into the um, <laughs> slides. Uh, more so, I wanted this, this, this to be more of a discussion rather than um, you know just me presenting, providing information. Um, I'd rather be more specific in the way of uh, if you guys have any specific questions. So yeah, we'll get started. So basic, basic general core conversations. I'm just going to talk about who am I, uh, the company I'm working at, and you know the benefits and caveats of working at a small slash startup company. Um, what engineers look for in a technical interview. So like if you guys ever get past the first initial phone interview and you guys move on to like the technical with like a group of engineers, um, I, I'm gonna talk about that as well. Um, and then also I'm gonna provide a sample embedded interview questions. Um, I'm not gonna say what specific company um, <laughs> I got this from, 
Um, but it is one of the larger aerospace companies. <clears throat> all, all I can say is they're located in Seattle. Um, and then I'm gonna provide a list of um, similar uh, companies that's similar to mine. So basically smaller ones, so nothing huge like SpaceX, Blue Origin, et cetera. These are all under 500 uh, employees, but they're all doing Oh. Hello, did you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, just you cut off for out. a moment. Oh, how much did you guys hear? Sorry. It said uh, Zoom crashed. Basically, basically, like first few cent, few words. Oh, okay. Uh, let me go back. So you guys didn't hear me talk about this, right? Oh, you don't have your screen shared. No. Yeah, you don't have your screen shared yet. Oh, what? Oh. I guess we canceled it. Yeah, uh, I just got a Zoom error. How about, do you guys see it now? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I see it now. I, I, uh, I remember that you were talking about this specific company in Seattle and you can't share my information about that. Basically oh, okay, that. okay, yeah. So basically, uh, I have a sample embedded question. Um, it's, a, it's, it's for an associate position. Um, like I said, I'm not going to say which company it's for, but it is a large aerospace company in um, Seattle. Um, so I will be help, like, you know, providing that. I'll share screen and then, you know, what to look for, what to do. Um, you know, kind of like an interactive type of slideshow. And then I'll probably list a bunch of other companies that's similar to mine, where if you do want to exponentially increase your career growth as a engineer, um, a lot of these companies do provide that type of environment. <clears throat> well, okay, so I'll start off with me. Um, basically, I graduated last year in June 2020. Um, I started working right away. Uh, I'm working currently at a company called Stellar Exploration. Um, I had offers from Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the main reason why I chose Stellar is because it's a smaller company with a startup vibe. And the reasoning behind that is because um, a lot of the larger companies really like to specialize you. So you're kind of stuck in the, you know, you're really specialized in the first few years until when you get to, I think my friend told me if you're elf six in Amazon, which requires four years or two to four years working at the company before you can start doing design, any design work, but rather than right now, you're just kind of doing support work. Um, but if you go to these smaller companies, um, you're actually going to be doing pretty much everything involved. So from design, development, uh you got cut off again yeah, i think it keeps crashing on me i don't know why i don't know if the screen share is the issue or, or may, i think maybe you're using too much data or something so basically maybe don't share it, your it, it's it's fine i don't have to share the screen um i'm just gonna i'll just talk about like i said this is i wanted this to be a general core conversation uh feel free to jump in if you guys do have any questions um but uh how far how much did you guys hear before i crashed again uh you're uh, talking about how everything you're talking about like basically how you can do a lot more in small companies. Oh, like okay. Yeah. Everything. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, essentially you're tasked, you're basically given a lot of responsibility. Um, you know, and a lot of these smaller companies that I'm going to list later on do provide this environment for you where you can increase your um, career exponentially. And, you know, I have seen the differences, um, especially when now that I'm also part of the interview process. Um, it's funny because our company does not have any administrative employees so no hr no recruitment it's just straight up engineers and then our boss um so we are part of the technical interview process um so like as like like i said before you know you do have to wear many hats when you do work at small companies um depending on the size of the company my company is actually only 15 engineers um but some of the bigger ones might have recruiting or stuff like that but you will be most likely be part of the interview process um yeah, so I graduated last year. You know, I did an internship at JPL for two years. Um, and after JPL, before I graduated, I did a lot of projects because I knew I wanted to embedded. So I, you know, did a lot of projects involving embedded. It was only recently when I started working at this company when I started getting into aerospace and, you know, had a lot more uh, hands on experience. Um, so I guess a little bit of our company. So our company is a, uh, we're, we're in, located in Central Coast, California. Um, so San Luis Obispo. We do uh, aerospace slash defense work. Um, our current main product right now is building propulsion systems. So we provide the main propulsion controller for um, CubeSats. Um, we have, we've developed monoprop and biprop thrusters. 
Um, they're very small form factor uh, thrusters, so it, it comes with a lot of complications in terms of designing the um, <clears throat> designing the system in such a way that we can squeeze out as much um, hypergoal as possible. So, like we use hydrazine as our main fuel system. Um, so it, it's it's really complicated because it's such a small form factor. But that's one of our main products uh, right now. We have done. Um, missiles in the past. We have, we've done a CUAS, which is a DOD contract, which basically is a cheap missile to destroy drones. Um, so again, that is also propulsion systems. Um, so a <clears throat> little bit on that. Basically, uh, <laughs> if no matter what engineer, you, uh, what engineer you are, you're going to be out in the Mojave. Um, we do mix propellant by hand. We do mix, mix the solid propellant. So we were mixing solid propellant in the desert. You know, we're testing it out in FAR. Um, and then we were, you know, we had a drone out and then we had all these uh, the electronics payload inside and we we're doing all this testing and integration. So it, it's a big process, especially for 15 engineers, you kind of have to be um, side by side with everyone. Um, we do work in person as well. I guess that's one of the other benefits, depends how you see it. Um, but these smaller companies, you can't really work um, remote, especially if you're embedded because you have a lot of hardware you have to, you know, touch a lot of like flight units, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and our company also does battery power systems. I can't really say which uh, company, but um, we do work with um, complex battery systems. So if you were an electrical or embedded engineer, um, you would work on the BMS, which is the battery management system. Um, so our propulsion system actually right now, um, it's being bought by a big customer. So one of the missions is called a capstone. It's uh, by NASA and it's the precursor to the Artemis program. Um, is anyone familiar with the Artemis program? Um, I've heard of it. Uh, I don't exactly know what they do, but uh, I've heard of it. Okay, so um, Artemis is, so this is a huge contract uh, that um, NASA uh, is giving out to, um, I believe ULA, uh, Blue Origin, Lockheed, and I think Northrop Grumman, or actually minus Lockheed, but Northrop Grumman. But it's a contract to basically return humans back to the moon. So if you're applying to a lot of positions in Blue Origin, a lot of their work has been going into developing their um, lunar lander, or actually a lot of these companies are um, being hired to do lunar land lander systems. And um, our Capstone is the precursor to Artemis. So it's a CubeSat that's we're gonna send and validate the, the trajectory of the rocket that's gonna use the moon orbit to, in order to launch the lunar lander on the moon. Um, so it's, it's a really neat project. Uh, the propulsion system is pretty complex that we're building, um, but th that's basically our main project right now. And we do we are working on another thing for Mars. I can't really say what, but that's another thing on the side as well, but it involves uh, bipod engines. Um, so uh, I guess a little, uh, any questions so far before I continue? I know I'm going kind of fast here, but I think we only have an hour and I kind of want to leave the meat of it to the uh, embedded question. Oh, I, I think I think it's fine unless anyone have a question right now. Yeah, I have a small question. Um, mm -hmm. When you said that you had, um, instead of going to these big companies where they uh, specialize you, uh, and then you decided to go to a smaller company where you have more mobility, mm -hmm. uh, do you know, like, could you just like kind of delve into what you sacrifice in, to get that mobility in that company? Sure. Um, so the thing is, it's not really mobility, but rather, um, so depending on, like, depending on a smaller company, we don't really have, um, it's not really like, okay, there's a, he's a lead, he's a manager, you're kind of doing everything, right? Um, you're, you don't really have a title. Our boss doesn't really care about titles. He thinks it's a over glorified way to convince you to stay at the company by paying you a little bit more. Um, but like, like I said, one of the caveats of working in a small company is um, smaller pay. So that is one of the things I kind of sacrificed is, um, you know, I do get paid a lot less. Um, reasonable amount, you're not getting paid like very low bottom, but you're kind of in the median. Um, but like I said, uh, so one of the examples I was just gonna bring up later on, but um, I actually was able to compare uh, my eight months of experience with someone who had two years of experience at a bigger company in, um, in um, San Francisco. And what that person do, did for two years, I was able to do in, I'd say uh, two months. 
Uh, and when we interviewed that person, um, they weren't very knowledgeable of the entire system. Rather, they were like very specialized on what they were doing. But even then, um, the problem was she, they couldn't really explain a lot of the process that went along with it. So I will be talking about that a little bit later. Um, so pretty much right after this, uh, well, right after like explaining what the company is. Does that, does that answer your question or? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, any other questions? Um, I had a quick question kind of picking back off of uh, William's question, mm -hmm. which is with kind of a smaller team, is it more stressful that you have like, because in a bigger company, I would imagine that you could distribute out the jobs a little bit more and it would be a lot less stressful for the project itself. So mm -hmm. how, how is that for a smaller company? To clarify, you're talking about um, deadlines and project management. Yeah, like just kind of like the overall project uh, workflow and stuff. Mm -hmm. So because, you know, we are working in person and we are a smaller company, um, getting acts like talk, like doing design reviews and um, talking to like other engineers in order to validate, you know, some of the software or some of the uh, firmware that you develop um, is a lot easier just because you can walk to the next, you know, table over and you're like, hey, you know, I have this question, um, you know, and what's what's uh, a little frustrating about smaller companies is i mean they're expected you to learn a lot of the stuff on your own so i mean depends how you see it for me it's a lot of fun because i'm used to kind of doing self-learning um but a lot of it is like digging into books and kind of figuring out what's the correct way of doing etc cetera, etc cetera. um there is no upper level management if you do have a question um our team is actually very uh multidisciplinary. so if someone's not a specialist on that like our boss will actually hire a consultant to come in and teach the whole team. So for example, um, uh, control systems is a very complicated uh, topic. Um, so he actually hired a consultant to come in. I'm, I'm sure you guys have seen his videos. He has like a lot of control system. I think Brian something on YouTube, but he, now he works for MATLAB. Oh he yeah, I know. Yeah, know. so he came in and he actually taught the whole team control systems, you know, brought in a little Arduino and kind of taught everything from like uh, feedback and transient and basically everything. Um, which was really interesting. So a lot of these smaller companies, you do get chances to do this type of stuff. And, you know, it is hard to do project, project management, but that is your responsibility as well. You have to work with the team. Um, you have to learn how to communicate effectively. You have to learn how to write documentation. So like I said, you're doing everything. <laughs> does, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Um, any other questions before I continue? Um, so, so we've, we also had like a uh, guest speak from JPL this Tuesday, mm -hmm. and uh, he was technically talking about how, how like when you get to the end of the project, basically you're 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 in time right now, right? But after at the end, just your the management just wants to talk to you all the time, basically, and that hinder your progress. Do you think uh, you 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 felt the same thing when you had like uh when, when JPL, and uh, how does you how, how do you feel like? how it is right now with you at your current company. Mm -hmm. So I, I got pretty lucky with my internship at JPL. I worked closely with my mentor. Um, so we were kind of side by side, but there wasn't really anyone watching me. It was rather, um, I made constant like reports to him every week. So like at the end of every week, I would write a report basically saying um, what has been done, what needs to be done and what I'm going to do. So it wasn't really like, you know, someone like on my ass, um, essentially it was, Kind of I took responsibility like okay if I don't want them to be on my ass then I should report um, you know once a week and letting them know what the progress is. Um, over here it's kind of like the same thing um, where any progress you make you kind of report it to the team or you know you post it in our the Slack channel etc. Um, it's, it's basically your responsibility to kind of update the team and you know make sure you're on schedule. Um, so it, it is a big responsibility like you know you have to do, like I said you have to do everything from development and then once you're done with the development you write the documentation after you write the documentation, you update the team on where you're at. So it's it's a big, it, it's a it's a really harsh learning environment, but I think it really toughens you up for these larger companies because um, the only bad thing about the larger companies is once you get hired, it's gonna feel boring compared to like um, the workload that you had in um, the smaller companies for sure. Is that an appropriate answer or is yeah. that what you're looking for? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm going to start talking about my day to day life at Seller if anybody wants a, another question, maybe. No, we're good. Okay. Um, so, 
Uh, I guess the day-to-day -day life is um, uh, I'm constantly moving from my desk, uh, which is where I do most of my firmware development, down to the lab. Um, I do use a lot of the oscilloscope tools, a lot of the logic analyzers, and then we do have a Sager tool. So I'm constantly going back and forth between the lab and the uh, the my computer screen, basically. So it's a lot of work. Um, but I'm also tasked with other stuff. So like, for example, if I need to build like a Hiddle bench, so hardware in the loop testing bench, um, I work with the mechanical engineers to kind of think of an idea like, okay, so how can we design the system in such a way where we're testing the hardware and the firmware? Um, so I do take care of a lot of like the wiring. Um, I take care of a lot of the um, initial setup, uh, making sure that what we do want to test is on the Hiddle bench. Um, or like if I go back to development, I want to make sure that the, it, you know, the software is performing correctly. So I would do like a performance analysis using uh, Tracelizer, um, you know, just a lot of this stuff uh, or like, you know, defining hard and soft requirements for the, for the, um, for the software itself by talking with other people. So like, for example, um, GPIO pins, as you guys know, can toggle at a rate of in microseconds. So you can toggle it on and toggle it off like really, really quick. Um, but, but the problem is whatever is connected to it, for example, in our instance, is a valve driver. A valve driver can only actuate um, at two milliseconds. So it requires a certain amount of charge before the valve can open. Um, if you were to toggle the GPIO pin, you know, on and off in like the, you know, the microseconds, the valve would never turn on. So the valve would technically never actuate. So it's a lot of these things you kind of have to understand as a, you know, as a engineer in, in smaller companies is because you have to understand the whole system. If you design something in such a way um, that doesn't meet the mechanical requirements, then, you know, you're going to have problems, especially later on. Um, uh, the major thing I'm working on right now is currently um, testing and validation. So I'm creating the testing framework for the propulsion firmware system. So now that we're finished the design development stage, now we're doing the testing stage. So we're, we're doing really hardcore testing. We've been hard doing hardcore testing in the past like three months. Um, we never had the testing infrastructure set up. So I was the one to kind of set that up and build everything and kind of have the system where we can just, every time a new firmware push comes out, we can you know test it and validate it. Um, you know, it, some of the smaller companies do come with benefits. I mean, uh, our boss buys us food a lot. So like there are times where, you know, honestly, there are times where you're going to be expected to work maybe 14 hours, you know, 12 hours. There was this one time where we had a hot fire to validate our thrusters and we stayed from 7 a.m. to um, like 3 a.m. at night. So it was a very long day. Um, but, you know, a lot of, you know, if you love what you do, um, it's not going to seem like a big deal. It's kind of be like you're back in school, you know, you're working on that project you're really interested in. Um, so it's a lot of that. There, are, you know, you know, it's not every day that you do that, but you know, there are times where you're going to have to like buckle down and, you know, work those extra hours just to get it done because you know you have such short deadlines. Um, let me think. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that's pretty much the day to day life. I mean, I do work consistently with all the other engineers. I do um, talk to them to derive requirements, etc. Yeah, any questions about that? Nope. All right, cool. Uh, so let me move on to the next topic. So uh, I, so now, now that I've got that over with, I guess I kind of want to help you guys out. Um, so I want to talk about how to interview for smaller companies. Um, in my experience, uh, smaller companies, they kind of do like an ad hoc way. You do get a technical interview. But there's not really a, um, so like for example, for Tesla, for Blue Origin, for SpaceX, for Amazon, they usually send you a online coding assessment. Um, that's not really done in most smaller companies. Uh, what it usually is, you have like a talk with the team or like a, one of the engineers to kind of describe your projects. So I, I guess my recommendation is whatever you put on your resume, make sure you know how to talk about. That's the number one thing. There are so many times where we interview people and they put something they didn't do. And we go really, we really dive deep. Like if we, especially if we see weakness, like you, you're really bad at describing, we're going to dig deeper into it. So we're going to talk about it. So whatever you put on your resume, make sure you're ready to talk about like, you know, that programming language you took for one class, you know, make sure you're going to be able to answer, you know, some pretty hard technical questions because they're going to ask you about it hundred percent or like, you know, that th like, whatever you put on your project, like, oh, I did, I helped do this. We're going to ask you, okay, what did you help? You know, like, do you understand the whole system? You know, do you, do you know how, like, we will ask you hypothetical questions. Like if you did this rather than this, you know, what would you do here? So it's, it's very, um, it's very 
well based on your resume because we want to see how passionate you are about engineering. That's one of the things. Another thing we want to make sure that, you know, it's not, excuse my language, it's not bullshit. <laughs> we do get a lot of resumes where it is basically, they put the bulk of the project, like the explanations, but they can't really explain what they did. And, you know, that that's like an instant no for us, just because, you know, obviously you can tell that person hasn't worked on it. So again, I, I can't stress this enough, whatever you put on your resume, make sure you can explain it. Yep. Um, so before these uh, interview questions, uh, recruiter will usually, or not recruiter, but someone will call you and be like, hey, you know, would you like have a talk? Tell me a little bit about background, you know, and we're going to talk to you about some, or someone's going to talk, else is going to talk to you like in some other interview. Um, make sure you do research about the company. Um, I, this is, I guess, a pretty obvious one, but um, being genuine is a lot easier than being fake. So if you're really passionate about engineering, um, it should be easy for you because it, it should be a company that you really want to work for rather than something like, oh, you know, I, I just want the money, right? Um, because a lot of the uh, interviewees can feel that kind of vibe if you're just kind of doing it for the money. There are a lot of times where we did interview people and it, it seemed like they cared more about the money rather than the projects. Um, and at these smaller companies, I think passion is what is probably what the most important is. Like if you can, if you put what are like on your resume, if you, if you're lacking, um, projects, but you're really passionate and you can explain a lot of the stuff you did and, you know, you can explain like, oh, you know, I have all these side projects and I've been doing this, I've been doing that, but and you can explain it in technical detail because you've been through all the struggles, you know, we, we prefer someone like that than someone who has, you know, two years of experience at some company where they don't care about the job and, you know, they don't care about their, um, they don't understand the whole system basically. Um, so just keep that in mind as well when you guys interview for smaller companies. Um, and try to relate some of your projects to the company itself. Um, I, I'm pretty sure this is a common thing to do as well, but um, see what their product is and then see like kind of you're selling yourself. So kind of talk about like, oh, you know, this project is applicable to this product, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If they have any um, white papers or, you know, you can see their products, make, do research about it. Have like a screen ready. Like when I usually do interviews, I have like a Google Docs that, you know, a section of, that's about the company, section about, you know, the um, requirements that they require you have as, you know, to be hired. And then, you know, make sure you relate a lot of projects to it. Make sure you're just pretty organized before the interview um, and just kind of talk about it. Make sure you can talk about engineering in the technical side of the interview as well. Just make sure it's not only about like the interview question. Um, any questions? Um, so generally, what I've heard is that generally, at least in larger companies, you have like this interview for, uh, for like eight hours or more. And, uh, like how, how does that have, like, how is the interview process in basically small companies? Is like, is it like the same? So, so actually, um, so after you finish, like, you know, if whoever you talk to is interested, most of these companies will ask you to do like a presentation, um, for example, Blue Origin. Um, I guess it's not really a small company, but kind of an example. So after the technical interview, they'll ask you to do a 15 minute slideshow describing who you are um, with two technical projects on what you did. And you're basically gonna be kind of like a group, uh, it's gonna be a group interview where people are gonna ask you very technical questions about the, your presentation. Um, Amazon, on the other hand, um, so they, they'll do like a, you have like a, what's it called? Online assessment, after the online assessment, you'll kind of be doing similar where you have back-to-back -back interviews with like 45 people. And, you know, they're gonna give you technical questions. They're gonna, you know, ask you about your resume, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for my uh, Microsoft interview, it was like a five round interview with like different people just talking about, you know, lead code questions along with like, you know, um, questions about your resume. So it really depends what you wanna do. Um, yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Uh, I just want to know, like, what's the process for your company, basically, like, you know? Like, yeah, so um, our boss actually, uh, you you know, if you pass after this uh, meeting, if you want to pass me along your resume, I can definitely pass it along to the team. Um, but if we do see, we basically base it off your resume. So we look at your projects. Um, if your projects sound good, if your skill set sounds good, um, we'll give you a call or send you an email basically saying, hey, you know, we're interested in your resume. Um, would you like to, you know, come in and do like a presentation with us to kind of, or I guess it's not a presentation, but rather a phone call 
and then we discuss the object like the the stuff on your resume so that's what i was talking about earlier um we'll really dive dive deep into your resume and kind of ask those really particular uh, que uh questions and some of those questions might not even be on your resume rather than its um implications of what you wrote down um so if you did this that means you must have done done this so how did you do it so a lot of those type of questions and then after that we pretty much let you know like you come in and then do like the presentation like blue origin did and then um, we'll let you know afterwards basically yeah good <laughs> yeah good all right awesome um so if you guys don't mind um i'm gonna move on to the uh, sample embedded question um it, hopefully this share screen doesn't crash again um let me make sure i select the right one and not the one with the answers on it yeah maybe maybe i think like sometimes if you just uh disconnect your camera a little bit or like don't show a camera for a bit maybe that would help but i'm not exactly sure i'll give that a try Sorry, give me when I'm pulling up the. Uh... If anything, you can resend the presentation to me, and I can share. Oh, it's not in the like I said. The presentation doesn't have anything. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> it's the okay. Here we go. Here we go. I didn't show really. So, do you guys see this? Can you guys see it? Yeah, now yeah. I see it. Yeah. So, like I said, this was a uh, uh, interview question for an associate position at a large aerospace company. Um, and I guess that's one of the things you're cutting off again. God, we can't hear you. Could it be the, uh, his Wi-Fi? Yeah, maybe. It's a Wi-Fi. Dang. Oh, oh he got kicked out too. Oh no! What I grabbed heck? a picture of that. If anybody wants me to like throw it somewhere. Yeah, I, I grabbed it. Maybe, maybe take a snip and share the snip instead. Yeah, we can just yeah. share. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, uh, for some reason, my sc screen share is not working correctly. Um, it worked fine, you know, when I for the previous interviews. But do you need to like write on there or anything? Because we took like snips of it. So if you want us to just share our screen of the snip. Yeah, sure, sure. If you guys, if you guys saw the, you know, the picture, yeah, we can we'll go through it. If somebody wants to share that, and then we can talk about it. Did anybody take snip? Okay, awesome. Um, so like I was talking about before, this was an interview position for an associate for an associate position. So something that required four to six years. Um, I was doing this as a kind of a, um, I guess, troll applying kind of like just seeing where, <laughs> what I could uh, do with my eight months of experience. Um, and a large aerospace company in um, Seattle kind of gave me this as an interview question. Um, so this is something very similar. So if you want to do embedded, this is precisely pretty much what they're going to talk about. It could be this, it could be something about like, um, you know, uh, uh, low pass filter, you know, but it's very similar to um, this. This is a C question that involves hardware and, you know, involves your knowledge of C. <clears throat> so if you want to take a look at this, so the goal is to basically keep the temperature of a mechanical system above a specified threshold, 32 degrees. Uh, it, they provide you the input, so a temperature sensor with an eight, a 10 bit ADC sensor read from a 16 bit memory location. When the ADC reads zero, that indicates a temperature of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. When the ADC reads 1023, that indicates a temperature of 100 degrees. Um, you know, and then the output is basically, you know, you flip a bit based off a memory location um, to turn on a heater or turn off a heater. Um, can anyone tell me what would be one of the first steps they would do? Uh, I would say read the ADC to see what the value is at right now. You could, but there's something that you would need to do to 
to convert the raw value into a actual temperature value, right? So you would need a transfer function. Yeah. Right. So I, I so one of the first things you would do would create a transfer function, correct? Um, so the problem is you can see that the uh, value, the zero value is actually 10 degrees and the max value is 100 degrees. So it's, it's not like a direct conversion. Um, so can anyone tell me uh, how would they write the transfer function? All right, so I'll give you guys a little help. So it, it's a really simple. Um, so this is a basic, uh, you know, y equals mx plus b. It's very linear. So you can actually just derive the transfer function based off, um, you know, x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1. So once you do the do the math, you basically get this value of 0 0.0879, um, which you would multiply the raw um, the raw value that's read from ADC raw, and that should give you the temperature, right? I kind of get what you're saying, but I just don't remember much of control system for now. Okay. Um, uh, so I guess this is pretty important as well. Um, try to study up on, you know, like a lot of the like embedded questions. You, you, if you're doing ADC reads um, from any type of sensor, you would have to transform that raw bit value into like a human readable format, right? You can't just read like a raw uh, value. Like if you read like, I don't know, 512, that doesn't mean anything, right? You're gonna have to convert it into like um, what the temperature sensor is. So a, a, good, a good thing to always ask is, um, you know, uh, is there any other additional information that you can provide me based off the um, data sheet of the temperature sensor? So like, um, usually they won't provide you the transfer function, but the data sheet usually does. But like I said, from this, from this um, problem, you can easily derive the, um, derive the uh, transfer function, which is 0.0879. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. Um, the next thing they're going to ask you is, I guess, do you guys understand what volatile does? Uh, I would say no. Okay. So, uh, this is a volatile is pretty important questions. I've been asked this multiple times in different interviews where they ask you what volatile means. So volatile is a declaration that means that tells the um, program that this variable is constantly changing. It's constantly being updated. So as an ADC raw should, as it's constantly reading, um, you know, I don't know, like a, you can say like a thousand Hertz, um, it's constantly going to be updated. So sometimes the program will only read one value and not continuously update it. Volatile basically just tells the program like, Hey, this is constantly changing. Make sure you're reading this value consistently rather than reading it the first time. Okay. So, so say we have the, um, transfer function now, we know it's 0 0.0879. What would the next steps be for you guys? And if you, and you know, when you guys are doing like interviews like this, always feel free to ask questions. If there's something you're not clear about, it's better to ask than assume. And you always want to be kind of describing what your steps are. So you're like, oh, you know, like, uh, first thing I would do is find the transfer function. This is what I'm doing. Here's the math. And then here, I got this value. So always try to talk when you're um, doing the technical problem. And this applies to Amazon, Microsoft, et cetera. You always want to be talking and explaining your thoughts. So if, if this program is supposed to continuously read from the ADC value and continuously check, you know, if, you know, to turn on or turn off the heater, basically a bang bang control system. How how would you guys do that? One of the first kind of kind of one of the first things you guys learned in like you know through basic programming classes. Do a while loop. Yeah, exactly. So you would put a, a infinite while loop, correct? Uh, this is no more different than you know your um, what was it? I haven't touched Arduino's in such a long time, but there's like the main loop where it continuously runs that after the initialization. So you would have to write that right. Um, I don't know if somebody, oh man, is there a way I can send this so somebody can start typing stuff? Oh um, I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to think of a good way to do this so I can start typing things in so it's more visual. Um, does somebody want to, I can send this to someone and then they can 
put it in Visual Studio Code or whatever, and then. <laughs> uh, you can send it to me. I'm gonna. Okay, let me let me okay. send this to you. Uh, I could just send it on Discord, right? And then you can. Mm -hmm. 1240. Okay, I'll try to be fast. I hope my Visual Studio wouldn't crash. <laughs> okay. I have a potato laptop, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, do you guys have any questions so far about the programming question? Um, I, 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 it's, it's pretty similar to what you guys should be doing in Robotics Club. So like a lot of like, you know, you should be reading ADC value, you should be controlling like GPL pins. And a lot of this is pretty similar to what you guys are should be doing, right? Um, it's just in a, I guess, a lower level format than what you guys are used to. <clears throat> oh, I just have a general question regarding like the interview process. Yeah, so, go ahead. Like, you know, for like so more like software jobs, you have to like do a lot of lead code for like coding interview. Mm -hmm. with, like that joint structure and algorithm. So I know with like, because I'm trying to focus on embedded system right now. So I don't know if the interpret process, do I need to like pro focus on the same thing or is like something more geared toward embedded system? Okay. Like, yeah, yeah. So definitely if you're um, interested in embedded systems, um, I would know some data structures. So like, you know, your basic binary search trees, you know, whatever you learned in data structures, I that's, Bigger companies like Amazon um, will definitely ask that, even if it's an embedded, even if it's an embedded, um, you know, position, they'll want to know if you know basic um, algorithms. Um, but the major part is kind of understanding a, lo a lot of the lower level operations of C. So uh, I'm trying to think of what's a really good, like a lot of the Arduino stuff can be useful, but you kind of want to um, dig deeper than that. Um, let me try to think of a, let me try to provide you a good book. I have a whole bunch of books here. Let me see. Um, so I guess a project, I, I would rather work on a project than kind of doing strict studying. Um, you just got to make sure you understand C very well. So like the pointers, you know, some of the decorations, you know, make sure you understand structs, unions, make sure you understand like enums. Those are well used. A lot of that is actually... Um, very well used. Like one of the questions, <laughs> this is another uh, troll pos uh, position I applied for was for the Amazon Project Cooper program. Um, <laughs> one of the um, uh, online assessment questions involved a complicated question involving structs. So you got to really understand like, you know, how do you operate structs in C, right? Like if there's a function in there, you know, how do you call that specific function in the struct? or you know, how do you access this specific bit? So it's all, a lot of it is also like a lot of bit bashing. So you kind of, you got to really understand like, you know, masking and, you know, if you want to access a certain bit, you got to use a certain mask, right? Like a lot of the lower level binary operators you want to understand, you want to be very um, good at. Um, does, does that kind of help? Or did you want me to like provide maybe like a project that you could do? Yeah, I would like to like more like specific way I can learn those things because I'm uh, pretty confused right now where to learn those. Cause... Okay, so actually, one of the um, projects I did uh, before, you know, for one of the, are you computer engineering or computer science? Uh, computer engineer. Okay, uh, do you plan on taking the TCP IP course? Uh, yeah, I'm planning to do that, but I'm just second year right now, so couldn't. Oh, okay, 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 for sure. Yeah, so, you know, a, a lot of cool projects you can do, you can actually even just start out with the Arduino. Um, I think that's a really good, solid foundation to build and kind of understand C. Um, you know, I, I, I want to provide like, a, you know, like you're in a robotics club, right? So, yes. So try to build like a simple control system, you know, using a couple of uh, peripherals and then just try to build your C program from that. Cause already we know is C, but it provides a lot of the upper level um, handling. Oh, this includes all the, okay. Well, I accidentally sent Harper the uh, answers, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, so yeah, uh, do uh, do the Arduino, you know, try to get peripherals working, try to communicate with each other. Um, I would also try to focus on SPI I2C communication. So like working with embedded commu communications protocol. So like, for example, like for most um, communications protocol, you would have like a frame sync and opcode, the, you know, packet length and then the payload inside, right? So you got to think about, okay, so if I were to write a state machine that would parse through this um, packet, 
you know, how would I do that, right? How would I recognize the start and end scene? How would I recognize the exact payload size? And, you know, how would you store it in such a way that um, if you can just, you know, if you just want like this specific part of the payload, you'd be able to access it. Um, and I guess just really focus on working with a lot of the uh, C99, um, C99, uh, sorry, C99 uh, program language. So like that's a specific version of C. Um, you can only use certain libraries. So like STD in provides all the uh, UN 16 T. So like they're packed, like they're basically uh, defined structures. So like 16 T just means it's 16 bits. That's the max you can put in it. If you put any more, it'll overflow. Or like eight, you know, UN 8 T means, you know, maximum of eight bits. So really force yourself to use these lower level libraries. And I think, um, when you guys do learn, take those basic programming classes, they kind of tell you to use like, oh, use using namespace STD, use IO stream and stuff like that. Those are like upper C++, but it's not really used in embedded because embedded is in C. So you want to stick with like STD IO, STD live, and a lot of those um, libraries. Uh, a good project I would recommend that combines both C and C++. Um, you can try learning how you use the, um, the Linux, system TCP IP calls. So there's a lot of system calls that you could do that you can work with TCP IP. So you can do like socket, it's called socket communication. Um, and let me provide this link in the chat. Uh, the, uh, so going through this will actually kind of help you a lot because it kind of teaches you about structures, it teaches you about pointers, it teaches you a lot about that stuff. Let me post in the chat for you guys, uh, if I can open the chat, <laughs> give me a moment. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, sweet. Yeah, so I would recommend reading this. Um, this is a really great gu guide to kind of te teaching you a lot of stuff about C and you can kind of build something cool. So you can actually set, like what I did for the TCP IP class, uh, we built an API that uses a lot of the, uh, a C++ API that basically uses a lot of the um, basic uh, header files that Linux provides and C provides to do socket communications. So we were able to load like an image, pack it into this little little protocol and then send it on over to like another computer and then they were able to unpack it and restructure the image and you know you get this really cool you know little thing to work on so you know a lot of the stuff i would recommend um if you want to get into the aerospace industry um a really good project would be um so there's this an association out there if you guys want to do this together so robotics can be applied to a lot of like rockets or aerospace in general um you can actually work together and buy something off of uh apogee rockets with um, so they provide stuff that um, provide rockets that you can basically shove electronics payload inside. So you guys can work together and build an electronics payload for a rocket. So you guys can kind of understand the whole entire system, right? Because that requires, you know, you got to understand physics, you got to understand, you know, like, okay, what do I want to record? Like what data is important? And then, you know, you got to do the data analysis after and data, like data visualization, but you also have to create the flight computer that controls, you know, whatever you want to record. So like, it'd be like a camera, you can have like, um, you know, sensors, but you got to have something that manages all that, right? So that's another good project if you want to get into the aerospace industry as well. Um, is that is that helpful? Uh, yeah, so instead of focus on like Liku and those, I should focus on my like projects that geared toward like the concept that I need to learn for an embedded system, right? Basically. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So like it's a really strong emphasis on C. And then if you do want to go deeper into embedded, um, depending which route you want to go. So there's Linux embedded and then there's um, regular embedded. So for robotics, I would assume you guys would want to run like a real time operating system for that determinism. So, you, you know, so it would be a really another really good project is trying to get a free free RTOS running on like a simple, uh, you know, STM chip or like, a, you know, TI chip or, you know, something really simple. And then have like basic uh, tasks that run along with modules. Um, I, I I did want to talk about like warp off free RTOS, but I don't think we have enough time. Um, I definitely would want to you know help you guys out and you know kind of help you guys come up with these projects. Um, I don't know if there's a specific way if I can kind of like help you guys help you guys lead a project, I guess, because I free RTOS is actually a pretty complicated thing. And getting everything set up, you know, you got to do like the PCB design. You got to think about all like the peripheral requirements and all that. So, if there's a way that you know, if Harper or Dawood can, you know, kind of um, think of a way, I could, I, I would be more than happy to help out. Basically, um, just you guys have to let me know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I think it would be a good idea, but the problem right now is that everything is virtual and it's kind of hard for everyone to get together and, you know. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you know, like a lot of these documentation, like like catting software or like, um, you know, Altium for like strict PCB design, a lot of that can be done virtually, right? Because all you guys really need is one, you guys got to define requirements, which is a document, um, you know, like a schedule, which is kind of something you can share as well. A lot of the stuff can be done virtually. Um, and if you guys do live in live within close proximity of each other, you can always pass on parts, you know, like one person can work on this peripheral, one person can write the library for this peripheral, et cetera, et cetera. The, the work can be very nicely spread out. Um, I think I think the hard part is to kind of see it from a system level perspective where, um, you know, you have all these different components, but how do I, um, you know, Devi out the work like how do I Wait, pass yeah the... that because uh, originally I just had a little bit difficulty understanding this, you know mm -hmm. the system and mm -hmm. it does make sense right now since we're already using a sensor and we can use bits as uh, as a transfer function mm -hmm. the problem is that I have never seen it used being used like that mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah I mean you know like I said like with any peripheral uh, the data sheets are usually pretty long they're like thirty plus pages. And if you're communicating over I squared C, um, oh, yeah. the amount of registers that you would need to set up, like for even controlling a simple motor, mo uh, sorry, motor is very complicated. Like if you guys decide to do a project that involves like brushless DC motors, um, choosing the part is hard and also operating the motor is very hard. The data sheet itself is um, very, very complicated. You're gonna have to really understand a lot of the registers settings and kind of the implications of each one. But not only that, after you guys do the design, you guys kind of have to do the proof of concept, right? You have to kind of create a, a test bed where you can test all your register settings and provide load and et cetera. So there's there's a lot of um, engineering processes, which I feel like I wish I knew when I was in Cal Poly Pomona. So if you guys need help with any of that stuff, feel free to ask me, um, you know, I'll try to respond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, like one of like the hard things is that, uh... At least what I've been trying so far is that I've been trying to get accelerometer, you know, mm -hmm. the data basically, and I was thinking maybe I can just integrate it, but it didn't work because uh, because of the errors in the statement in in the reading of the sensor. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's not like really that simple as you guys as you initially think. Maybe like what you learn in the class isn't right. It's isn't but applicable. Yeah, so I think that's definitely one of the problems with a lot of pomona classes i've experienced them too is they do teach you the basic foundations i mean a lot of it is just tools that you can start learning but it's up to you to kind of learn right i mean i, I know you're a mechanical engineer so it might be a little bit harder for you because you haven't exactly took those courses um but if you're interested in embedded i don't know how far you're into um like are you a senior or junior i am a senior ah uh, okay sorry <laughs> I, I would have recommended uh, mechatronics for sure uh, a lot of my mechatronics uh Coworkers actually touched a lot of embedded stuff. They had crazy projects where they're like um, doing um, self balancing robots and stuff like that, but they designed it themselves and everything. Um, but, you know, definitely to get started, I would recommend, you know, starting small and just build your way up. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess uh, because part of the post of this, let's uh, go through this very quickly. I think we have like five minutes. Um, so up here, I created the raw threshold. So this is the raw value where, sorry, the, um, Basically, that's you know that's the, there's a threshold, right? Because we have a 16-bit value, but the ADC is only 10 bits, right? So there's only there's a specific value that you cannot pass and you know cannot go under. Um, we have the maximum value, which is you know in hex, which is 0, 0, 0 FF, which is 1023, I believe. Um, and then we have the heater mask, which basically if you do the and not or you know or you can flip that one bit because um, I think in the previous screen share sorry i don't i think some of the information is cut off but if you guys look at that screenshot earlier it said one of the thing was like it's the second bit to turn on or turn off the heater right so yeah um so like i said it's basically a simple while loop you read in the adc value and then you know you can i guess i didn't put it in there but you times it by the uh transfer function and then you would do a comparison and then you would handle you know your etc and then you go down um, and you do the same thing. So you got to really understand, I guess another thing I would recommend you guys to buy um, is if you guys want to go into embedded aerospace, uh, get Mizra C 
Um, it's a book that provides the rules and directives for you to follow when programming um, flight critical systems, especially stuff involving people, involving like, you know, space missions. Uh, Misra sees a really good document to kind of follow along with to, um, you know, start programming. So a lot of this stuff is applicable to Misra C. So like if you're explaining what you're doing, like, oh, you know, because I'm reading an ADC value, I always want to check if it overflows or if it's, you know, less than the value than it's expected, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, I do the specified um, control system because this is a basic bang bang control system where it just checks the value and it turns the heater on or off based off that ADC value. And, you know, but a lot of it comes into just kind of like understanding like, okay, why do I need to do this? Um, you know, like, what's the reasoning for this? Um, yeah. Um, and if you guys want, I have a Tesla interview that I that I did as well. Um, that's for embedded entry level. Um, so you can you guys can kind of get a hint on if you guys want to work with Tesla and see like, um, what they want you to do. And I think I think that'd be really useful because it's not aerospace. So you know, if you are international, you could work for Tesla. And they would they might be able to sponsor you. <laughs> Um, so I, I can provide that as well. I'll pass that along to Harper and then she can distribute it to you guys. Um, so I, we're almost out of time. So, I mean, if you guys want to ask any specific questions, please let me know and we can get that answered. For finding your uh, like smaller company, oh. how did you, yes. Yeah. Sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> that's one of the things I missed. Uh, let me provide a list of uh, companies for you guys. Sorry. Oh, perfect. That. Thank you. Yeah. So here I put it in the chat. This is all, these are a lot of the larger uh, companies that are smaller. So under 500 people. Um, mm -hmm. So, and they give, you know, I, I kind of give like an example of what they're doing as well. Um, so feel free to take a look at that if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Like Virgin Orbital is like one of the ones I've been hearing a lot about. Which one? Virgin Orbital. Oh, yeah. 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 Because, mm -hmm. uh, I actually knew, uh, I actually heard about it from like a professor over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking about like basically doing like last uh, administration, like how they just uh, reduce like uh, like the size of the satellites that can go in orbit. Mm -hmm. And he was talking to me now like how Virgin Orbit like was one of the first ones that like start sending the small satellites in orbit basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of the, um a lot of these uh, companies on this list are working with CubeSats. Um, they're like basically, basically taxis for these CubeSats, but um, keep in mind, develop, like developing a rocket does take a lot of software and takes a lot of embedded work. You have, you know, myriad of sensors and, you know, actuation. So like, you know, uh, pneumatic valves, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of work involved in uh, building a rocket. And then you have to like test the rockets itself, right? So the test stand itself for the rocket, for the um, propulsion system is complicated as well. Um, so there are a lot of jobs out there for you guys to kind of look at and vary depending on what you guys want to do. Um, but if you guys do want to get into the aerospace industry here, you know, that's basically a list of what you guys want to do. Um, and I, I'm not, I, I think some of these systems, uh, some of these places, like for example, Planet Labs, they might not require citizenship. Um, some of them are just like working with data um, but I can ask around and see, you know, if there's any companies out there that work with aerospace that do not require, you know, citizenship and they will sponsor you for the H-1B visa. So if any of any other club members is interested in that, I can also um, provide a list of that. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? Uh, that would be great for me because I'm international. So I think most of the defense company I would not be able to work with. So it would be great if you can provide a list. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I guess after when I, I got to head back to work soon, but um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ask around. My boss is basically, he's been in the aerospace industry for like over 50 years and he's consulting and also running this company. Um, so I'll ask around for him for you guys and then I'll provide a list and send that over to Harper and she can distribute it to you guys. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, unless you guys have any more questions, um, you know, I'll, I'm happy that I was able to like give the speech, give this talk. I really want to give back to, you know, some of the students at Cal Poly Pomona. If you guys have any questions, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I think that my email is provided in the Discord. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but if you guys need my email, free feel to email me, um, you know, like career questions, you know, maybe even just like general questions, um, always feel free to email me. Um, I'll, I'll respond as fast as I can. 
Okay, yeah, I guess I'll share your email with everyone mm -hmm. in Discord then. Yeah, that's fine. Totally fine. All right, I probably did it. <laughs> Can share um, in our Slack too for the members and stuff. But yeah, thank you so much, Kyle. I think some of us had to head off to class right now. But yeah, yeah, I, I gotta go back to work.